Hi all. We're going to have a look now at the Linares tournament in 1990, which was won by Gary Kasparov. Here in round two, he was playing Nigel Short. He played the English opening with c4. Short replied with knight c6, so not going for the symmetrical variation of the English, but instead trying to use his pieces con to control the central squares. With e5, though, he does commit one pawn at least to try and keep possession of the central squares. After g3, g6, we see now Kasparov just playing um, classically in the English opening. His Fianchetto bishop offers nice support for his control of these two key light squares in the centre. And after d3, d6, he actually plays e4 now. Normally this might not be a very good idea in variations where black has played c5 for example because black would then have a great square here for the knight and white's fixed pawn structure would mean there wouldn't be a, a great variety of plans. Here though Kasparov has got an idea that um, black has difficulty to play d5 or to get a knight to d4 in a lot of these variations so maybe he's justified this Botvinnik kind of setup more against black setup. So we see here short playing queen d7, so he's actually preparing castling queenside and maybe a kind of hack attack against Kasparov's king if Kasparov dares castle kingside. He doesn't routinely castle now, Kasparov instead plays knight d5. So he's worrying um, short a bit. If short now plays bishop h3, then takes and then knight takes c7 check. So Short actually plays knight c7 now to do something about this knight on d5. And here now, Kasparov changes the pawn structure again in a very interesting way. He plays the move d4, so he's lost the tempo by not playing d4 earlier in one go. But there are some very subtle points at work here. After c6, he actually plays knight e3. And Short is now presented with a very uncomfortable threat of d5 from Kasparov. So Kasparov is in effect encouraging Short to play e takes d4, giving up the tension in the centre. But before doing this, Short plays bishop h3 and now Kasparov castles. So we have now this space gaining threat of d5 to contend with. Short solves this problem by playing bishop takes g2. And after king takes g2, he doesn't castle queenside because d5 would be very dangerous. Say c5 and then white can continue with later b4. And black's king would be under a very dangerous attack. So short plays e takes d4 here, releasing that central tension. And now instead of immediately castling queenside, plays h5. So this seems to be quite um, a direct attack against Kasparov. He now plays a4, countering Short's attack and discouraging black from casting queenside. Short now plays knight h6, so the knight coming to h6 may be useful to black for not just knight g4s, but maybe f6 and knight f7 later. Rook a3 was now played, so this rook might be usefully uh, placed on the third rank as a defensive resource, but also coming to d3 maybe later. So that's a very interesting move, rook a3. After castle's queenside, Kasparov continues with a5. Now short continues his attack with h4. So we have here a very exciting game, with both players seemingly attacking each, each other's kings. After a6, Kasparov has established a very dangerous fawn pawn. Now how is he going to use this fawn pawn on a6? Short seemingly blocks up the position and, and doesn't seem to have too much to worry about at this moment. Kasparov now plays knight f3 and Short opens up that h-file for the attack, at least giving his rook and queen chance to coordinate on this h3 square. But the threats aren't dangerous at the moment. Kasparov now plays, after Short's f6, now plays c5. So he's interfering with Short's plan of just knight f7 followed by queen h3 check and maybe knight g5 later. By this pawn sack, Short takes it and now Kasparov plays queen b3. So what is the idea of this? Well immediately queen b3 stops knight f7s. 
Knight g4. Let's have a look. If Short tried to play Knight g4 or maybe Knight g8. Knight g4 is actually favoured by Ribka here. What would Kasparov have done against this? Maybe it is quite a dangerous threat. Let's say Knight takes g4, Queen takes g4. Ribka thinks actually Black is slightly better. For example, Queen f7, check. Now King g1. And Short actually would have an interesting resource here. Rook h7, according to Ribka. Just sucking the, the knight on e7. Let's say queen takes e7. And now in this position, there's an absolutely incredible resource which Ribka picks up. I wonder if you can see it. I'll give you five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Bishop h8, just trapping white's queen. Maybe Short had not seen this incredible variation. The white queen would be trapped here. So if that is the case, then... In the game, after Queen b3, maybe Knight g4 was actually playable. Anyway, that, the analysis is too complex to examine here in our short time. So let's have a look at what was played. King b8. And now Xparth played Rook d1. And he plays now Knight c4 with an ominous threat all of a sudden of Knight takes b6 in many variations. So he's interfered with Short's plan with this pawn sack. And not only that, he vacated that c4 square for the knight coming in to harass black's king. So white seemingly has the attack now, not black. But after knight f7, there's still these dangerous threats to contend with. Queen h3s. Because Parv plays rook d3 though, not concerned about queen h3. Also we see here in this particular position, the a6 pawn is all of a sudden unpre. Would this have been too dangerous to take? Let's have a quick look at that, because Ribka likes winning material. Check. Say. Now, isn't this attack just too dangerous? Let's say rook d7, rook on the 7th, is usually a good idea. Queen takes c4, rook takes c7, rook d8. Now here, white would seem to have strong positional compensation. And Ribka starts favouring white, actually, with rook d7. Because this is with white's pieces coming into black's territory. So anyway, so that pawn wasn't taken. Instead, short plays g5. He probably thought queen h3 check was harmless. It does look as though it needs more pieces. Xmarov simply moved his queen back to b3. And after queen e6... We see now that black has put his queen and pre, which Kasparov uses soon. After bishop e3, knight c8, instead of, say, bishop takes c5, which would seem to be logical to exploit that pin on the b6 pawn, Kasparov plays knight takes b6. Let's have a quick look. Bishop takes c5, though. What would black have played here? Maybe this is good fight as well. Because if, say, knight d8, then maybe rook e3 protecting that e pawn from black's queen. And white's position is still quite dangerous. Say king a8, bishop b4. I think white would still be a bit better. Ripka seems to think white would be okay there as well. But actually, in the game, Kasparov played knight takes b6, offering a peace sacrifice after queen takes b3, knight d7 check. So as we see Zug's check. And so Kasparov went a piece down. But he's got a lot of black pawns to attack and to win. He first wins that pawn on c5. And after bishop f8, he plays knight d4 check, picking up another pawn now, c6, and soon to win the a7 pawn. So this temporary peace sack is gaining back a lot of pawns all of a sudden. So here we have a very difficult position for Nigel Short, who played now knight c4. And after rook a8, Short went into a lost end game almost. After rook a7, check. He now played rook g8. But now, Kasparov played rook e7, check. And after king d3, a7, and now all of a sudden, 
Rutherford thinks White has a crushing position. This past pawn potential is very, very dangerous because White's threatening things like knight b8 now, followed by a8 queening. So short's really tied down. He can't move his rook because of rook takes g7 as well. So what can black do? It seems helpless for black. So short's gone wrong somewhere. After rook c8, the game finished like this with black sacking a pawn there for very little compensation. And then Smart finished with rook d8, so brutally queening his a pawn.